Registration show is brought to you by Wheelhouse Storage, luxury garage condos for all of your toys. Visit wheelhousestorage.com for more information. Now on to the show. All right, three, two, one. Welcome to the License and Registration Show. I am your host, Mike Ryu. Today, I've got an awesome, awesome guest with me, old friend of mine, Ernie. What's going on, buddy? Sweet. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. This oh. is pretty, pretty cool. Yeah, this is uh, something a little different. Yeah, no, this is awesome. This is uh, uh, definitely, you know, something I've always wanted to do and uh, awesome opportunity to do it with a long lost, long time friend like you. Definitely. Look forward to it. Going to have some fun. I'm ready. <laughs> so we'll dive right into it. We'll Ooh. talk a little bit about history because, of course, we've got plenty of it. You in the car scene in Jacksonville, mm -hmm. or I should even say Northeast Florida or Florida at this point. Mm -hmm. But back in the day, Ernie Perez getting into the car scene. How did that happen? So actually, <clears throat> so how it all started was there was a girl that I really, really liked and had a crush on, and <laughs> she worked, or she was going to school at Orange Park High School. Well, <clears throat> long, longer story short, a friend of mine had gave wind that she worked at this old diners, like um, kind of like a Sonic back in the days, but the name of the place was called 50s. And it was right down on Blanding Boulevard, and she was a car hopper. Oh. And so when I was there, um, I will, of course, you know, 16 years old, I wanted to be around where she worked kind of thing. <laughs> and right. um, I was in the area and decided to stop right in. And I decided to kind of hang out without being stalker mode and get some food <laughs> and start talking to people. And ironically, the kind of people I was talking to had a car club, which at that time, I didn't know anything about car clubs. I just knew I cleaned cars because my first job was at a car wash. Mm -hmm. And all at the same time, it gave me a reason or excuse to go there because on Saturday nights, they would go there to hang out very similar to the days of today going to meets and all that. So, so time came and I got hooked into, um, you know, paying attention to the cars and seeing how they were customizing all kinds of cars. Um, I wanted to be a part of that too and have another reason to come to that fifties restaurant. So, um, before you knew it, I was part of that car club. What were you driving at the time? Oh my goodness. It was a 1983 Toyota Celica and it was <laughs> something my parents handed down. And you know, I think we've come full circle cause I think those are actually collectible now. Yeah. I mean, now people want them things, but back then, I mean, I was rocking little 13 by seven inch wheels and, and stretch tires. And you know, I was running them that set up for, <laughs> oh my gosh, long before people even now are even born. So. But yeah, I started going to car shows at the car shows and got it, you know, hanging out with that car club all over the state of Florida. And before I knew it, do you remember were... the name of the club? Oh yeah, absolutely. It's dynamic dimensions. I, I, I remember that. Yep. It was yep. so cool. It was, uh, and this was mid nineties. This was 1991. <laughs> oh, this is early nineties. Oh, I remember it. Yeah. This it is was, Nirvana. This is <laughs> 19. Cause I got my license in January and I was in a car club in May of 1991 because my first job was you know i remember it was hot i remember it was we um one of the first car shows i went to was in ocala mm -hmm. and it was like silver springs so right. um so yeah i traveled all over the state with that car club so tell me and, about tell me yeah. a little bit about the scene like the early because like i came in mid 90s like 96 97 so i kind of i kind of know that gotcha. but how how was it when you first jumped in like was it was it big? Was it growing or was it kind of static? So the scene in 1991 was lots of low riders and lots of mini trucks. So when I say low riders, we're talking about, you know, old, older cars like, you know, Impalas and, um, but was carried over to th the current generation at the time, which were nineties cars. 
and they were just lowered cars. They were, we didn't have coilovers back then. We were just taking the springs out and riding on the bump stops <laughs> on the shocks. And we were taking out road reflectors, <laughs> you know, that was the thing. Like if you wanted to go over railroad tracks, we literally had pieces of two by fours in the back of trucks just to get over these railroad tracks. We would literally rock the car over mm -hmm. to clear, to get over. So, you know, I've been driving lower cars, I guess, for that long. And that was the normal thing to have. And mini trucks were real popular because back then there were the Isuzu's, the Toyota's, the Nissan hard bodies. So they were fairly cheap. They're reliable, good on gas, which, you know, back then gas was 99 cents, you know, so a gallon. wasn't that big so of a deal. <laughs> to us, minimum wage was like $4 and 15 cents. So it was comparatively like cheap gas to get around town. Mm -hmm. But yep. That. So we're talking, so hydraulics on the scene? Hydraulics was on the scene. Reds was the thing to have. And Pro Hopper was also a big brand to have. Mm -hmm. But Reds Hydraulics was dominating the scenes, you know, in the West Coast. And it came over into the East Coast. And it was, you know, if you didn't want to chop your springs or take your springs out to have, you know, something that was really cool, you would have hydraulics. And, you know, it was only two shops in town that were really like specialized doing that. Right. And then when I met you, you were, I believe already into DSM. Yes. So yes. transition from early nineties to you getting into performance. Okay. So the, that Celica, I went, you know, show after show and had covered like the Carolina areas and all through Georgia. And it got to the point where the shows were being hosted by the same, um, you know, same people. So mm. it was the, the judging criteria was pretty monotonous. It got to the point where you already knew like what to expect. You shoot up, you knew exactly who yeah, was going to get a trophy. Exactly. Yeah. And so yeah. I was getting older and I was going into, let's see, so I met you when I was in college. Mm -hmm. So at that point it was, you know, time to get away from the old parents hand me down <laughs> and it was time to like, you know, I earned, you know, like a, a nicer car and so, um, the deal for my parents was, and of course my parents helped me with a lot of things back then, but, um, the deal was the car had to be efficient and had to be good on gas and it had to be safe. And so I was looking at Mitsubishi Eclipses in like 97, mm -hmm. 98, 99, yep. that Bondi generation. And I was looking at Acura Integra's and yeah. I was yep. back then doing like hard research on everything, the type of gas, how much leg room they came with, how much, you know, uh, how much miles per gallon they got. And it's like a research paper. Oh, it was. And not like everything <laughs> else. And most everybody knows like, you know, me now today, that's, I still do that, you know, in research before I, you know, I dive into anything. And, um, ironically at the time, the scene, a lot of the Filipinos or the Asian community, they were known to drive Honda and Acuras. And I didn't want to be that stereotype. And I'll always, you know, I'm always that one that thinks outside the box. So I was already kind of, you know, gearing towards the Mitsubishi side of the world. And so, um, because there was like one person that had a Mitsubishi Eclipse and the rest of, you know, the car cultures were all driving Honda and Acura's if you were Asian. So I didn't want to be that guy. And so <laughs> I chose a 97 Mitsubishi Eclipse as my first platform on the sport compact car side outside of the low riders scene. And yeah, was that a GST it was, right it off was the bat? A, it was a GST and, um, it was Monarch green Pearl, which was the color that, oh my gosh, I've, I carried on for many years to the point where I've painted my mountain bike that I currently still have right now. That is that color. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> love that color so much. I, I still have something, a piece of that. So what did you think? Now we're getting in mid nineties, late nineties. Mm -hmm. We're starting to get close to the fast and the furious I kind of call it like a, it's almost like a before and after mm -hmm. I, 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 I liken the Fast and the Furious franchise to being a very definitive moment in the car scene because there was kind of this subculture of car people. Mm -hmm. And then the movie comes out and there's this huge influx of people coming in. How do you feel that the movie franchise impacted the car scene? Oh, that's an excellent question. For the better or for the worse? 
Ooh, for companies that were into the scene, obviously for the better, because it was saturated. You could, you could literally make something for any car and people were going to buy it. Um, for the people that were, you know, into the scene before the movie came out, which I'm going to call those people that the, the kind of people that were, um, you know, underground, right. They weren't, there wasn't a trend yet. It was literally an underground street racing scene here in Jacksonville and Orange Park, mostly Orange Park and Jacksonville. Um, <clears throat> so we were doing exactly what that movie portrayed. But the thing was, you know, in California and all, you know, in Texas and California, they they were so far ahead of us. They were doing it for many more years than before that we here in the local area was, you know, street racing. So... You know, to us, it was all underground, like the ones that were actually racing. Mm -hmm. And when this movie came out, it was almost like we were exposed and exposed in a way where I would say, I mean, the good part was it was cool seeing our actual cars, hearing our actual cars, mm -hmm. seeing cars like ours in the movies. Well, in the, in the first yeah. couple of movies, we actually knew people in the movie. Yeah, absolutely. There was, you know, a lot of teams that were represented like Jade Motorsports down in Orlando. Um, a lot of, there's some guys up here that auditioned to have their cars in uh, Fast and Furious 2. So it was very connected to the scene. Um, but in the midst of the whole exposure and all that, because remember when the first movie came out nobody cared about the plot it was just all about the cars and what you know we can all relate to and then the movie franchise they literally started adding star after star and right. be, be started a you know creating a plot to where now it's completely not even from oh it has nothing yeah, to do with, has cars, nothing to do with cars anymore so right. so in the beginning i'd say the first three it was true to the scene and having like you know authentic you know, the wheels that were actually, mm -hmm. you know, what, what, um, we would call actual custom wheels and the cars, the type of cars. Um, but as for exposure, man, it was, it, you know, after the movie came out, it just, the, what it did was it also killed the industry in a way that all these knockoff companies came about. eBay came around, um, Amazon wasn't out yet, but eBay came around and then all online sales, stale stuff sorry coming about so people didn't know if they were buying real things or if they were buying cheap things they were kind of getting away with it mm -hmm. but it took away from like companies like Greddy and hks were the big brands that had the car parts that were you know research and develop for the cars right and they were losing to all these companies that were just knockoff brands that came you know, that wanted to make money out of a movie because there was such a demand. All these kids were, I mean, there were Chevy Astros with like APC taillights, you know, <laughs> everything had clear taillights, everything had neon. Altezas everywhere. Altezas taillights on everything, you know, like people didn't even understand why they had them. They just had to have them because it was in the movie where all the people that were doing it before the movie, mm -hmm. it was something more genuine, you know? Right. So, yep. Nice. Mm -hmm. So we get out of the early 2000s and mm -hmm. fast forward and we can actually fast forward all the way to where we're at today with the scene. Oh, and you ha definitely have not taken your foot off the gas, no. <laughs> so to speak, in regards to shows you're attending and everything else. Yeah. Um, compare the show scene today to a decade ago. So it's or even more. Sure. It's 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 funny seeing like things go full circle like let's say neons or lights or led lights um the effect that it has under the car so there was a dude there was a guy named lawrence who owned neon riders way back in well <laughs> 1995 six you know those yeah. days i'll never forget he had a warehouse off of stockton street and if you needed so there were tubes there were led lights back then because yeah they we were legit have, neon we didn't tubes. have leds in the 90s right so um if you wanted a color you go to see him and you know that the kits were around 200 something dollars or whatever so and it's funny because it got mocked at and was laughed at to have them somewhere along the line and then it came back like that part of the scene came back with i noticed the that. advent of led lights because yep. one they're cheaper they don't break they're not going to crack they're uh, a lot you know more efficient they're cheaper to make and 
you can kind of wrap them all around your wheel wells and everything. And having that same effect, it was basically like what we had back in the nineties, except with a different, mm-hmm. you know, updated type style lighting. But, um, so to answer your question, like the scene has, has done full circles like that, where, <laughs> where the whole stretched and smaller wheels was like the game, the name of the game. And I mean, we were doing 13 by sevens back in the nineties long before you know they started to redo them again here in the 2010s and and 15 so um it just i think the generation it it depends on you know who or how you grew up with your parents into it did you grow up as you know a 10 year old watching your neighbor um modify their car and you seeing that and you want to do your own play into Mm -hmm. it so uh, I think that's kind of how it, it came around. How about the like the size of the shows? So oh, I sure. mean, I know because like back in the day, you think we had shows in Atlanta, like the Nopi Nationals, yes. things like that. Do we have any of these mega shows anymore, or are they more n- more niche? More niche for sure. So there's you know types of meets. Back then, a show consisted of like the car show. There wasn't like a track involved. There wasn't drift. There weren't different entities involved. There was the bikini contests and all that, but those mega shows like Nopi and of course SEMA was still getting their foot on, you Mm -hmm. know, um, they were becoming popular thanks to this scene. Um, But, you know, they were big before the movie came out with the lowrider scene. So, um, but as for big shows like that, they're really, I mean, the closest thing to that size is, you know, import face off, which is in a, at the track at Atlanta. Um, But because they're more niche, style you know like um you know like the d1 you know the the, the drifting scene you got right. you know um you got all of i mean you still have the the 1320 racers you know going down the tracks and they have like this weekend they have the texas or you know 2k meet over oh, in yeah. texas and all yep. the supers and gtrs mm-hmm. are over there so they're definitely more niche you know and um um it's just more spread out it's not like one big collaboration of types of cars Mm -hmm. at one place anymore they're um you know they're definitely more niche than than so you find that to be able like back in the day the the larger shows like you would have low riders imports domestics like everything all side by side kind of like the old you know just saturday night meetups where everybody's intermingled but nowadays you know you have your import face off or right. you know Eurofest or you know the in even now even in <clears throat> like you look in the Europeans and you got water cooled events versus air cooled mm-hmm. events. Yeah. You know, there those you types of things. H two O and all that. Yeah. So back then it was very um broad as I guess would be the word because it was imports, domestics, all of that was combined and it was very aftermarket driven. So it was, you know, if you had you know, like I said, LEDs, custom taillights, you know, maybe some springs here and there. The, the low rider scene and like the sport compact, it was more like that was what it was called. Mm-hmm. Now, literally, they're so divided. Like there's, there's drift shops, you know, for actual people that are only interested in drifting. Then there's like, um, people that love just air ride equipment they, they want the stance look they want they don't care that they can't go over speed bumps at their own house or get up their own driveway they just want that look you know there's so <laughs> think, many types like we were just at a cars and coffee yeah well, about a month ago and an frs just full Hammer. static stanced and it trying to crawl over the speed bumps at the mall to get into a parking spot. Yeah, and they're not even that high <laughs> over there. <laughs> no, it's, it's just FRSs can, you know, BRZs can can be hammered, and um, and that's just it. They're so yeah, that's a perfect example. You have the FRS BRZ community. Oh mm-hmm. my gosh, you know, you have that. You have uh, the whole GTR community. You got all those guys. Um, then you got the nostalgic Nissan guys. You know, the two forties, and yeah, and you know, that's just like one make. Then you know, you have all the domestics that's still out there, you know, with all the Mustangs and, mm-hmm. um, and then there's a huge Mopar community in Jacksonville. Oh my gosh. Mopar has exploded. There recently. must be like five, six different Mopar clubs in Jacksonville alone. And they all roll deep with like 10 or 20 cars. I mean, it's like a whole family gathering. There's like your mama, <laughs> your cousin, they're all. It reminds me of the backyard group. scene from the first Fast and the Furious yeah. where it's just, just 
a whole crew. Yeah. <laughs> and that's crazy. So these see these guys, so even though they are, you know, that, that, um, even though there's like 10 different Mopar groups, they have the same style. Right. So, right. um, you don't have like 10 different GTR groups when you're in this little, you know, com GTR community, they are all about going fast. They could care less if you had neons, they could care less if you had air ride, but if your car wasn't making 1300 horsepower and is in Texas right now, you're not really part of that group, you know? So <laughs> amateur, it, yeah, it's, it's wild, you know? So you, it's, they're definitely fine tuned for where back in the day, mm -hmm. it was very broad. You were kind of just in this, uh, select all type group. Kind of like everyone was figuring it all out at that yeah. point in time. Yeah. Nobody knew what was, you know, cool and, to them, what was cool was literally looking at a magazine and was like, oh, yeah, that looks neat. I'll do mm. that. Yeah, because we saw kind of an, uh, an explosion of speed shops, late 90s, mm. early 2000s. I mm -hmm. know Jacksonville definitely went through a few. Mm -hmm. um, and a couple kind of stood the test of time, still around. Yeah. Um, which is great. Yeah. Um, what Do you have any memories, like dino days or anything happening in any of those? Oh, yeah. So speed tag performance off of Blanding Boulevard right there by... A good old venture landing, which I think it was just called a venture landing back then. Yeah. That was a pretty cool speed shop, you know, with John John Arbizo. Um, and that, before the movie, you know, you're talking 1996, 97, he was building cars. And, you know, back then, tuning wasn't, you couldn't just dive right into an ECU and start remapping things. It was, no. <laughs> you know, bolt ons were hard to find. Again, this is an era with no eBay, they didn't have the internet. Your research was just hoping you find a magazine Flip with through someone, the right magazine. Yeah, and hope that that person had the same kind of car to you, and literally, hopefully, they put the specs onto that car, and you brought that page, you rip that page out, and go to a shop like Speed Tech and be like, mm -hmm. "I want this, and can you get this for me?" And so, you know, there was that shop. Um, Chassis Craft was actually around, and that was mostly you know domestic yeah, stuff. Yeah, domestics. You know, and then Chassis Craft eventually made its way to Speed Craft. You know, mm -hmm. you know, with Dwight and them, yep. and um, and and so on and so forth. So yeah, there was uh oh Dino days. So yeah, there were. So <laughs> what's the craziest thing you've seen on the Dino? Oh, uh, well. Um, crazy would be like kind of, it's hard to say crazy as in like something falling out or something like wild, like thousands of horsepower. We, we'll do one of each. How about that? Mm, I'm going to be honest. I haven't, I don't have any, no, no, nothing, just no catastrophic nothing, stories. Nothing personally that came out. No, nah. mm -hmm. <laughs> you think, I believe me, it was something would remind me if, if there was. Yeah. I think um, at one time at a, at a, and it was a racetrack event. Someone brought out a mobile dyno mm -hmm. and there were some big high horsepower domestics trying to do a shootout and see who could, who could roll out mm -hmm. the biggest numbers. Mm -hmm. A big Viper GTS rolls up, mm -hmm. just does one run and just does like 900 something horsepower. <laughs> Not now yet. And second run, he's just, you hear turbo spooling up and just mm -hmm. pop. <laughs> oh no dead viper gts oh, now on no. the dyno <laughs> yeah no I've, I've been to so many dyno sessions that they all kind of just you know they do three pulls and then they're done and then you know i mean i'm trying to remember all the way up to being up in ohio for the shootouts and like most dynos are you know as long as they're safe which mo luckily i was fortunate that every time i was near one at an event they've strapped them down they've been safe nothing's come off nothing's you know, broken anything that's da that's hurt somebody. You know, no cars have blown up on the dyno. No, no. I mean, they may have blown up, but nothing like you know worth. Wasn't like a piston through a hood. Yeah, nothing crazy <laughs> like that. The worst thing I think I might have literally witnessed is like an oil dipstick go flying, and of course, <laughs> you know, things go flying. But other than that, no, nothing exciting on in my whole history of that. And I have. I mean, I have, I've been to many a dino shops in town and I've followed many of dinos in this town go from shop to shop. So yeah, no, that's true. <laughs> so these days on the show, sir, about how many shows a year do you go to? Oh, nowadays, because my work limits me, um, I only go to the major shows out of, out of state and, you know, out of town. Um, I still do a lot of the charity ones, you know, when I can and I, I've, I've literally done everything from mom and pop shows, like, you know, for charities with uh, wh whether it be, I actually hosted one for wheelchairs for kids a long time ago, but, 
Um, yeah. So nowadays I do the major shows with BC Forge, you know, okay. and, um, what's kind of uh, your favorite one to attend right now? Oh my gosh. My favorite one is this weekend. Actually, it's, oh, no. uh, it's in Chattanooga and, oh, the uh, Tennessee show. and it's, yeah, it's the Riverside meet. And it's not just a, that show particularly why I like it. It's the area. Like I love traveling. That's was why I put so many miles in the car, but I love to travel. And one of the places I love traveling is Chattanooga because of all the mom and pop you know, like, um, establishments around there, just everybody's super nice. And, um, it's, even though it's rained the last two years, it's, it was still an amazing experience. I mean, that's just how awesome that little meet is. Actually, it's not that little, but, um, it brings out also the best of the best. And, um, and it's nice seeing cars that come from like the Midwest and, you know, not in the Florida area. Things because, you don't see pretty frequently. Yeah, like. Cause you go to all the shows in Florida, you'll see the same, you know, fast cars, the same fancy cars. And, mm -hmm. um, you go to Chattanooga and Nashville, you'll see cars. You just don't see in person down here. Um, but that's definitely one, of course, simply cleans, you know, always one that I like because of all the, you know, the friends that come out, mm -hmm. you know, from all over. Um, you get, you went sure. down to Miami for a couple of shows. Yeah. Yeah. For Miami, um, many of shows down there and Palm beach convention, the convention center always pulls some really good shows and, uh, indoor shows of that down mm -hmm. there. But, oh, recently, I guess last year, uh, Tuner Evo um, did one for the first time. They did an outdoor show for the first time at um, at the Wynwood Arts District. So mm -hmm. that was my cup of tea. So now you're supporting locals. You're kind of, you know, every backdrop is a perfect opportunity for a photo because mm -hmm. no two are the same. Right. Um, it was very industrially. And, and you can see the challenges that that, you know, the Tuner Evo crew had because it wasn't a typical, you know, big box, you know, indoor arena where they can just line up cars in a row and yep. here are the vendors and here's this. They actually had to work off of the street blocks and oh, exits cool. and entrances and make sure like, you know, everything was still flowed well that day. But that right. was definitely a unique show last year. I really liked. So, but one of my most favorite shows that I actually am not a part of or even enter or anything um, is actually the Celebration Exotic Car Festival. Yes, yeah, so that's coming up here soon. Yes, yeah, so that is Fingers something, crossed, hopefully. Still. Yeah, I always look forward to that show. And um, just because I've always liked exotic cars and, mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's just, uh, it's something cool. It's, you know, it's it's uh, a, a mature kind of crowd. Right. Um, you know, the kind of cars it brings out is amazing, um, especially if you're an exotic car fan. Mm -hmm. um, you never feel like your life is in danger because there's actually responsible people there I and mean, there's millions of dollars of cars <laughs> you know that's there you know and no one's just gonna start hitting the two-step and burn out there's and, there's no zip tied uh, front bumpers no nothing's falling apart you know at that particular mm -hmm. you know invitational type show so yeah cool. that is now at your peak you were going to shows like all the time it oh, seemed like so, yeah so if, if you could call out a year not necessarily the year itself but yep. in that year how many shows did you go to? That year was actually, I can name it, it was about four years ago. And um, I went out of town or at a show 40 out of 52 weekends. I Jeez. remember that. I remember that very distinct because I was at the point where I wanted to sell the house and just buy an RV. And I actually started doing research in an RV. But, and just um, travel to shows. Yeah, and travel. My, my, my job at the time, um, I basically was off at 2 p.m. on Fridays and off all weekend. So every Friday I was on the way to a show. By dinner time, I was either in Atlanta or mm -hmm. Miami or somewhere in Tennessee. And it just, you know, it broadened my horizon of um, I'm just seeing all these. But, you know, that time, at that time, I was, I was in, uh, I was kind of rebuilding personally, like my life in the sense that I, you know, come out from the divorce and I wanted to see what was out there. I wanted right. to see what was the scene, what, you know, where am I missing? This or, was your time to get out and reconnect. Yeah. And, yeah, and reconnect and see who's doing what and what vendors actually worth, you know, checking out and see and who what was still even around. Yeah. Or what shows were actually worth checking out. Cause there were some shows that were pretty not worth traveling out for. That's for sure. <laughs> you I could mean, have gotten a couple of those weekends oh back. My, yes. If I could, I could have probably, I would have taken 10 weekends of those back, but, <laughs> um, but it's hit or miss, but you know right. what? In that 40 out of 52 weekends, I've met a lot of people, you know, they're genuinely into mm -hmm. the scene and, um, that have the same passion I've had since I was 16. So, it was just a different time or era of my life. Mm -hmm. And 
I was hitting every show I could possible. And my calendar was literally, okay, where am I going this week? Oh, okay. Well, that's where we're going. So, you know, it was, <laughs> it was sweet. And, and that's why I really couldn't get myself tied into a car club because I was just that, you, you know, were all over. Yeah. Clubs just, you know, I mean, uh, I rolled independent for a while and I kind of still am. So <laughs> cool. So I want to touch base too on your, your car journey as far as what cars you've been into. Mm -hmm. But prior to that, you talked about, you've met a ton of people, a lot of different companies out mm -hmm. there right now. Mm -hmm. And you actually right now work with a company in particular, right? Well, I mean, well, you're with, right. with well, BC. Yeah. Well, BC Forge. Yeah. So, um, uh, I love promoting these guys. Uh, they're based out of the wheel divisions based out of Ormond beach and the suspension side. Most everyone has heard of is BC racing and they're out of Oviedo, Florida. And, um, I can support, you know, a, f uh, a family owned or, um, locally owned is what I would call them, you know, type company more so than these guys. I mean, they will bend over backwards for anyone and everyone. And just, you know, they're just the best of the best that's out there in my eyes when it comes to customer service, mm -hmm. um, turnaround time and value of, you know, what you get, you know, cause there's so many car manufacturers out there, or wheel manufacturers out there that, you know, you're, you're literally just another, you know, car and, you know, they're building number 2,338 wheel for you. And here you go. And, you know, they shake, they shake your hand and you're done. Like you right. disconnected from them and you never see them again, you know? And, um, these guys from the very beginning, I've always had a great relationship with them. And, um, I mean, now I call them friends, you know, and I feel like I'm part of that family, but, um, yeah, I couldn't say no great more things about them. Where'd you meet him? Um, I met him at import, um, import Alliance, uh, import face off. It's a show in Atlanta. That's okay. That big one import Alliance actually, um, Earlier, I might have said in Port Faisal, but it is in Port Alliance in Atlanta, Georgia. It was a major show, um, which I would call major. Mm -hmm. Which card did you have there? Back then, it was uh, the Infinity G37, and on it, I had Vogue Racing wheels. Okay. And, yep, I remember the setup. And one thing I hated about the wheels, I mean, other than, you know, loving what they were, but, like, one thing I hated was cleaning around all the little rivets, you know, the mm. hardware. <laughs> F my fingers are like raw, you know, <laughs> during the winter time. So I had walked all around this particular show and we were all in VIP and I was hanging out with uh, um, Kindred Impulse back then. And um, I had noticed there was this wheel shop or wheel, you know, vendor that was out of the ordinary. They weren't like in vendor's row, but they actually had about four spaces or five spaces of their cars um, you know, I guess their cars that mm -hmm. had the wheels and in that they had, you know, a pop-up tent. And so while I was killing time, cause like I said, I was kind of <laughs> walking around aimlessly. I noticed that they had a type of wheel that had hidden hardware where, you know, the bolt or the hardware was mounted from the backside where it kind of cleaned up the front fascia. And so I started looking at it and I was like, Oh wow, that looks so cool. You know? And apparently at the time there were a couple companies that were, you know, that had that going on. Um, but I really grew to liking, a, you know, particular wheels and their finish and their colors. Um, and I ended up reaching out to, you know, Jonathan DeHate. And from that point on, he, you know, he reached out to me and asked if I wanted, you know, to, you know, travel with them and, and, um, you know, rep some of their wheels and, and here I am, I'm still hanging That's out awesome. with them and, and I rock out with them and I'd be with them this weekend, but you know, work calls kind of, yeah. Thing. So, <laughs> yeah. And there's a lot of local guys now. I see quite a few people rolling on BCs. Yeah. Um, Alex Santa Maria. There's a, there's a lot of the Nissan guys, the infinity guys because of the influence, obviously, you know, right. so, uh, there's that, but then, you know, you have the B and W, you know, community with, uh, you know, Tony Palumbo and, um, you know, there's a, there's a definitely a handful of us here in Northeast Florida that are rocking, uh, BC forge wheels and, um, you know, and again, there's, there's a lot of companies that's out there that a lot of people would prefer to have, but you know, this right. is just my choice and my preference and my experience with them has been just, you know, no less than amazing. That's awesome. So, so we talked about you were in the infinity at that point. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about starting at the infinity mm -hmm. as we roll into your next couple of cars. Sure. Let's, let's go through that. So I wanted, so I got this infinity because one, um, I wanted to, so like, just like the story with the Mitsubishi and the Honda, I didn't want to be like everybody who drove a Honda. I had to be outside, I think outside the box. So, 
Um, I wanted not just a convertible, but I mm-hmm. wanted a hard top convertible. And so, you know, in that divorce that I'd mentioned, you know, prior, um, I had, I sold, um, my track car and a convertible and an SUV all, you know, at one time. And, um, I kind of wanted an all in one, something that was nice, comfortable, more, gr- more grown up, you know, kind of right. sense. <laughs> A little more and, mature. Uh, more mature. And <laughs> I promised myself I wouldn't put one piece of carbon fiber on this car. And I kept my promise. It, there was not one piece of carbon fiber hit that car. But I wanted something different that nobody had. And okay. I wanted a hard top convertible that still looked good with the top up and mm-hmm. looked good with the top down. And, you know, was reliable and, you know, was kind of like, it was like my first real purchase by myself, like on me. I didn't have right. my parents' help. They didn't have to co-sign nothing for me. You know, that was my first, you know, real car myself. So after researching, of course, I did, you know, months of researching between four or five cars. Um, it led me to the G37 convertible, and I absolutely loved it. I was, it was the car that I drove 40 weekends out of 52. And, and you put some miles on I put some miles on that sucker. Let me tell you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> A lot. And then as we kind of get to your next vehicle, what, what caused you or what made you to start looking for this second vehicle? All right. So that leads to that car. And because I traveled so much and it was the only car I really had, um, at the time I, I ran a gym downtown. And if anyone's ever been to downtown Jacksonville, parking is never fun. Even though I had a parking garage, no lie. The parking garage I was assigned to was built in 19, whenever cars were built. So in the 1900s <laughs> and had these 90 degree turns <laughs> It was so narrow that it was only room for one car to transition from one floor to the other. And if you weren't looking at this convex mirror, you were going to have a head on collision. So this is the type of garage I was parking in every day for work on this only show car I had. And then if anyone's also driven downtown, the cobblestone little intersections they have, the, mm-hmm. it's just terrible. Like I felt like I was beating up on this car that I had so much pride and joy. And on top of that, traveling, you know, the 40 weekends out of the year. And so I said to myself, I was like, oh, my God, I need to get some. You know, I was always I always made fun of guys that had daily drivers like, OK, well, you have a daily, but you had the garage queen. Yeah, you have the garage queen. I didn't want to be that guy. But I was like, you know what? I think it's time. Like I've proven to myself that I can drive this car, uh, you know, back to back weekends at Atlanta and uh, to wherever. And um and it's okay. Like it wasn't like full blown show car where I had to trailer it, but mm-hmm. I would say, was it a booth car? It was a booth car for many shows actually. So, um, that leads to my next car, which was, I wanted because of the gas and, and the miles, I wanted an electric car. So somewhere around the, the infinity phase that I had, I mm-hmm. had always wanted a Tesla and specifically a model X, uh, P 100 D Tesla, because I saw one at cars and coffee. And at that time I was like, no matter before I die, I'm going to have that car. I want that car, but it was so far fetched, like, you know, $159,000 yeah, they, at this point in time, they had just yeah. kind of come out. Yeah. In 2016, I wasn't like in that mind frame yet, but it's always been one of those like goals, you know, like people have goals and right. Lamborghinis were always like, a, you know, something in the back of my mind, but I, um, so back to my, you know, chintzy story, I, I wanted something. <laughs> And I started thinking about getting an all electric car. So obviously the big point in that is wanting something that didn't have to, you know, you have to put gas in Two, I wanted something that was reliable. And, um, the more research I did on electric cars, like full electric, not the hybrids, like full plug in. And if you run out of battery, you're, you, that's it. That's a, that's a wrap. So out of all the electric cars that was out there, the Nissan leaf was, the only affordable car that you could really get that was, you know, realistic in the city of Jacksonville, because, well, I travel a lot in yep. just our city of Jacksonville. So the range on these leaps were 115 miles. And i said, you know what, let me do some research on one of these. And I realized how ugly they were. I was like, Oh my God, <laughs> I don't know if I could really buy one of these. Cause they were that ugly. And well, it was odd cause so, they were making electrics like, you knew every electric vehicle was an electric vehicle. Like nothing was made to look 
yeah, normal. All of them were ugly. Every electric car, even at that time, unless you had a Tesla, it wasn't really attractive. I mean, every hybrid. Look at a Prius. Like you can't. No one can convince me that a Prius looks amazing. You know, off the bat, like <laughs> uh, a Volt, the Chevy Volt might be, you know, pretty cool because it actually has it's probably lines. the closest to a normal yeah, car. But you know, when this car uh, Leaf has been around since 2011, I knew that it was somewhat dependable. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, it kind of went with the Nissan Infinity you know theme because i True. wanted to keep it with True. you know that that theme and i said you know so i started researching on just the leaf what it can do where i can get around with it and um after time went by i was at a car show in atlanta mm -hmm. and after researching down here in in, the, in jacksonville by the way leafs were going for like eight nine grand and i my goal was to find one under six grand with, I didn't care how many miles, cause it just was gonna be, you know, my throwaway daily driver. So I'm in Atlanta and it was Memorial Day weekend and it was raining that weekend. And so everybody started packing up and headed home. And I actually intended on staying for the weekend and hanging out with friends, but nobody wanted to do anything cause it was raining. So I said, you know what, I'm gonna go back home. But before I leave, let me check this, what's around this area. And let me tell you, I think every leaf died up in Atlanta because <laughs> there were pages and pages on Craigslist. There were tons. And it makes sense because Georgia at the time in 2011 had the best rebate for electric vehicles. Oh, the state rebates. Yes. Right. That's all the incentives. Yep. And because of that, everybody who bought one in 11 or 12, 2011 and 12 were just re-upping their cars to the next leaf or the next electric car. So there was an abundance of Nissan Leafs in Atlanta, which if anyone's ever been in Atlanta, at any time of the day, you're driving oh, at 30 miles an hour. So, the, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so I bought this, I literally called these two dealerships and one of them let me test drive it all day. And I literally tried to kill this thing. i called my other friend. It's like, Hey, we're going to, you need to take me all over Atlanta. And, and we had the AC down or up all the windows down. I floored it at every, uh, you know, uh, traffic light, like trying to kill this thing. And I said, you know what, if I can do this with this car, like current situation, I can have, I can, I can handle, like I can right. invest in this thing. And I bought that thing for $6,000. And so, oh, so you hit your goal. I hit my goal. But on top of that, I bring it back to Jacksonville and I did more research and JEA gave a thousand dollar rebate for, you know, electric cars at the time, used cars, um, which they don't do that anymore. So hmm. I technically bought this car for $5,000. So then I fell in love with this little peppy little car, but as ugly as it was, I already had plans for it. I was like, Okay, well, so it, it's not staying you know, stock for long. No, I mean, it just was like, it looked like a tree frog from the front. I mean, it just was hideous. <laughs> like, it rode amazing, surprisingly. And, but it was just the ugliest thing. Like, there's nothing else on the road that looks as ugly as one of those electric cars. And so, of course, you know, I had to have my influence and put, because the other car, Infinity, had air ride. So, of course, I gave the challenge to, you know, Chris at Malhini Customs and mm, he put an air mm -hmm. ride kit on it, you know, and then. Of course, I couldn't have air ride and not have wheels on it because I can't roll around with little 14 inch wheels. So I put <laughs> this BC is a Ford 1991. On them. Yeah, this <laughs> exactly. So before you know it, it had its own Instagram page and it had more followers or it was getting more, you know, visits per, you know, size per visit like a day compared to the other car I had. And so between the two Instagrams, one was really like blowing up and I was just shocked because this was my throwaway car. I didn't care if I parked on the grass or like the Infinity. I never even drove it on the dirt. I didn't park it on grass. I didn't take it to the beach. Right. This car, I'd go, if I could go mudding with it, I'd air it up. I mean, you know, <laughs> the Infinity, I drove it through like a tro uh, two tropical storms, a tornado, I dodged a hailstorm. And like I was doing that with Infinity. And so now I have this Nissan Leaf that I bought for five grand. What's the worst that will happen? It gets flooded. Okay, whatever. You know, it's five grand. Five but grand. <laughs> it just wasn't as like meaningful as the Infinity. It never was. And and then, so I'm driving this electric car, and it's I'm seeing that it, the benefits because I'm living the EV culture they call. Mm -hmm. it. And I started realizing if I can get around this town, I can get to Orlando. Obviously, plan trips to Daytona with 115 miles. I was like, I bet I can get. I can own a Tesla. Like, where am I at in my life? You know, now I'm obviously getting older. Um, where am I like really in my life to be able to afford one and, you know, that kind of stuff. So right. even through all that, like on the back of my mind, uh, Model X P100D was just like, it was, it, it was like the light at the end of the tunnel. It was coming. So. Right. So, and then, so you had the leaf for how long? Two, two years. 
about two years. How many mile? How many electric miles did Ooh. you cover? Oh my gosh, it's on my Instagram. Like I literally put so many thousands of miles to the point where I equated how much gas I would have spent, the mm-hmm. maintenance I would have spent, and it equaled to and all the miles I didn't put on the nice on the Infinity, mm-hmm. and it was it paid for itself. Like, yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah. Wow. I think you said something like it paid for itself. Absolutely. Yeah, I was driving. Yeah, I, I mean. I was passing by gas stations where people lined up on it, you know, during the hurricane. So it was, you know, those kind of things. And, and, you know, again, it's, it, I had to understand like, it's a, a culture too. You can, right. I didn't just buy the car and hope that I can get around town. I mean, mm-hmm. I mean, I was, I'm just fortunate where I live with the things I do in my personal life. There's like a charging station everywhere in this town. And, and, and a lot of times and, charging yeah. stations are in like great spots. Absolutely. Like it gets you access a lot. Yeah. Oh, p- parking. So parking in the same garage that I was telling you about earlier, um, downtown, uh, when I got this leaf, I, um, I managed to upgrade the parking garage I was in and it was a couple blocks further. But the reason I wanted to upgrade was that particular parking parking garage had a charging station in it. Mm. And so every day I come into work. So people ask me first question is, Oh, how much does it, you know, take out of your JEA electricity and all that? I go, I don't really know because when I had my house, I would leave purposely 20 plus miles left on the range, Mm -hmm. just enough to get to work. And then I plug in at work at the charging station and by noon it was fully charged. So I'd never, it never came off of my electric bill. Right. But so, yeah, so I was fortunate to have that. And when you have the same parking space in a downtown parking garage and you work downtown, that is like, a, that's value in itself right there. And your company pays for your parking. I mean, I was like, oh, when, when, at all. yeah. So every day I park next to this Tesla and it was an end spot. So most car guys know like end spots, end spots is where to be. Spot. <laughs> So like every day my little leaf was like, it's in its own spot. And, and so parking, people don't realize like some of EV parking are closer than handicapped parkings, like at the Uh, zoo. Yeah. Yep. The zoo, Ikea, I mean, name it like at the mall and most of them, 80% of them are free Mm -hmm. hotels. Like they make it so convenient to have an EV car and you know, it'd be free. Right. So yeah, I just got to be savvy at where you go. Well, and, and more and more spots and charges are popping up almost oh. every single day. Yeah. There's an app. There's a couple apps that you can use and you could be in the middle of nowhere and you be like, there's no way there's going to be a charging station here. And sure enough, there's one like in some park somewhere and you're <laughs> next you to know. some guy's barn. Yeah. There's one at like a brewery <laughs> in Riverside. And I was like, Oh my God, there's one here too. And you know, cause they encourage you to be there and stay there for right, a few right. hours and, and, uh, and yeah, it works. I mean, and there's an incentive for the businesses that have the EVs mm-hmm. you know, or the charging stations. Mm-hmm. So like out here in Nogatee, hopefully somebody brings out, you know, a charging station. So, you know, cause I'm sure there's many a Tesla owners out here since I followed one in here, but yep. That's um, awesome. Yeah. So we got the leaf mm-hmm. and we hit a point in life where we realized that possibly this light at the end of the tunnel is, could be a reality. Yeah. I, uh, so the leaf died. <laughs> um, well. I killed it. I literally, <laughs> I mean, it was a 2011 and I had researched one of the things that could happen to that particular year. It happened to it. And it was an onboard charger that failed on it. And oh, I was okay. not even mad gotcha. because it, I didn't, la- I didn't plan on having that thing for more than a year, but it lasted two years. And the original plan was actually to sell the infinity first right. and sell everything off it. And then have one garage left because I was going to sell the garage off, you know, that was parked in and then just ride out with the electric car Mm -hmm. until the model Y came out or the price point for a model X was more my cup of tea, you know, my man manageable on my budget. Well, it was the reverse. The leaf died first. And then I was kind of, well, then I started driving the gas powered car again, which, you know, was the infinity. And to think like, I was like, man, when you've been spoiled driving around everywhere with no gas, and then you're putting sixty dollars of gas every week on this, and for two years, yeah, for it's two not years. like you'd only been doing it for a month. So put it this way: the first year I had the Leaf, I put gas in that car in the Infinity twelve times, and it was only the times I went out of town. You going to shows? Going to shows, exactly. Which I did minimize my car show. I wasn't doing forty weekends anymore maybe like 12, 15. So it definitely went down. <laughs> but the fact that I only put gas in it 12 times in that year. And then the second year I had to leave, 
I might have put gas. Uh, actually, I know I put fif- gas 15 times. Right. And three of those 15 times was like the last month, you know, kind of thing. Because, um, you know, I brought pre- prior to getting my next car. So, um, so yeah, I mean, here's the theory about the whole gas and paying electric thing. So, you know how, like, if you've ever owned a, or rented a house and then you finally buy or invest in a house and you have something and you're putting money in and you own, you will never rent anything ever again because you realize all that money I've been renting, mm-hmm. like, has been, it's gone. Like, yeah. Right. Well, I would be just a fool to go back from owning something and then renting something. And so here I am, I've been getting around town, you know, gas free and doing every, all my, you know, events and all the things I like to do for fun, gas free. And then all of a sudden I'm paying for gas again. It's just, it's that whole mentality. Like, oh my God. It's like you went back to renting. Yeah. I went back to renting. Like I'm paying to get around town where I really, you know, wasn't anymore. And so it's just, uh, that's just one aspect of having uh, an EV or, you know, that kind of a lifestyle. So, you know, not to delve in more, there's so many more things about owning a EV car that is advantageous over a gas powered car. So, gotcha. Yeah. So we're getting into the, the new, new, the new car. Oh yeah. So yeah, back to that. So basically I, <laughs> I killed the leaf and um, yeah. So the timing, what couldn't have been more perfect. My, I was, Ironically, you know, and, and this isn't for everybody, obviously. I, I had a timing in my life where I had paid off three credit cards, which surprisingly were all pretty big sums in the beginning. So I had three credit cards I like paid off at the same time, sold the leaf, and at the same time, sold um, well, at the time, you know, I was down to one car, and um, you know, with you know, some effort, I ended up selling the infinity as well mm-hmm. to the point where I had two garages and a bicycle and a skateboard. So <laughs> I was like, oh, man, I gotta get a car, <laughs> but you know, I don't know if I can budget, you know, a hundred something thousand dollar, you know, Tesla yet. And right. the bottle, why, the more I looked at it, the more I did research on that, I really realized it wasn't what I wanted. And I was basically going to settle if I was going to wait for that to come out, which is going to come out in any couple, you know, a couple weeks now. So, but at the time this was like November, right? I was, you know, I was like, well, I'll suck it up. I'll drive my mom's car, or my dad's car, or, you know, and, and just get around, you know, hanging out with friends and kind of take a break from the show scene while I wait for this car. Well, I started doing research and I, you know, was one researching on just Tesla period. And buying through tesla and if anyone's ever done that it's you know kudos you but that is one of the hardest things to communicate with because you're buying cars out of sight or um sight unseen um so i started researching on buying through third party Mm -hmm. dealerships you know that obviously still carry the the warranty it's just those dealership people the salespeople just don't have history on that car so it's kind of like the trade-off like you know right you know so luckily i have some friends that work at tesla and you know, that were able to help me out and, um, make sure that everything was a go for this one particular car I really liked, which happened to be a model X P 100 D. So, and it popped up, it popped up. you were getting ready to go look at one. Yeah. So Where? I was looking all over the country cause Tesla only has so many and there's only so many P 100 Ds. And I was very specific with the year and the manufacture date because it had to have a particular uh, version software on the car. Okay. So there was one I was looking at in Chicago. Mm -hmm. There was one I was looking at in Sedona, Arizona. Mm -hmm. And there was one I was looking at in California. And I was like, they all had trade-offs in them. You know, one had high miles, one was up north. And I was really not wanting to buy anything up north because of the salty roads, even though I think they would have drove it because it was an 18. Um, Considered a lot. And all of them were hovering around um, 98,000 to a hundred thousand dollars. And at that point I was calculating in my head, you know, <laughs> where I could, you know, am I good? Can I realistically buy something like this? Am I just doing this because I don't have no cars and I'm riding a skateboard, you know, kind of thing. Right. And, um, I'm, you know, 44 years old and realize, you know what? I'm single. My condo's paid off. Um, my credit card bills are amazing. My credit scores, I'm 800 plus. Like the planets are aligned. Yeah, everything's aligned, like perfect. Like, man, I've always wanted a Lamborghini. So this is the car I really wanted. And it's just as fast, but the doors and all that good stuff, not faster or quicker. Um, and so I was planning on flying out to Sedona, Arizona mm-hmm. to look at this one particular one. 
and I had been talking to the salesperson for about a week, nothing crazy. Um, I had one of those, I had one of those vouchers for like one flight, one air flight around the continental United States and I was going to burn it up because <laughs> it was expiring in December. So I was kind of like, like really, I got to use it. Yeah. I wanted to use that up. And, um, so just, I don't know, I was on Instagram and an, and I've never seen another sponsored ad like it, but an auto trader ad okay. came up and I was like, auto trader. I've never even thought about auto trader. So I go on auto trader just, you know, I think it was like one of those late night, you know, we were watching TVs mm -hmm. and, and one popped up in the local area, mm -hmm. like five miles from where I live. And I was like, there's no way that this exists. There's no way. And it was everything. It was better than everything I was looking at, except for the mileage. It had high miles considered for an electric car. And so I was like, I got to see this car. So the next morning I literally called the dealership. I had them, you know, identify the car. Mm -hmm. They described it as is. And, and I said, okay, well, I'm, I work till this time. I'm coming to see it. Please have it available for me to see. Okay. So I worked a little late that day and, um, the car was already in the studio. So I go, I walk in and I was like, Oh my gosh, like this is like insane. Like it really exists. Like this, this isn't like a typo. Cause you know, like some just ads. a few miles from you. Yeah. So I had the VIN number. I, re I had my friend at Tesla check it for me. He verified it was go. There's no red flags on it. Mm -hmm. Um, I verified everything in the features. I looked and I checked the invoices. I literally did a walkthrough of this car inside and everything looked good. And so I was like, so you're trying to find the catch. Like, like okay, this thing's less expensive than all the ones I'm looking at. Mm -hmm. Um, it, you know, what's the story behind it kind of thing and all that. So I asked the salesman the next day, I, was, I said, Hey, can I take a look at it outside? I want to look at it in the sunlight. Right. I want to make sure there's no the, like magical yeah, the showroom paints, lights. Yeah. The paint's not mismatched. There's not, you know, I mean, Tesla's already known for their misaligned everything panels and doors, but, <laughs> but I wanted to see if there were like, you know, any damages and, you know, that I can catch in the door or jams and all that. And so I looked at it and he let me drive it. And, you know, prior to this, two years ago, I actually had test driven one similar to it just cause you know, I knew I was getting closer to wanting one. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was a go, I was like, this is the one, this is it. So then I started looking at, you know, banks and financing and all that. And, um, and here it is. I have one. <laughs> That's awesome. That's my current car sold, <laughs> you know? So what's it feel like now to have that? Like you've been looking at one for so long. Oh. And it's, now you're a few months into ownership. It's still surreal. Like you're, I'm driving down JTB and I'll see another Model X, which is rare, but you see one and it's a P100. And he's like, oh, that's so, oh wait, I have one of these too. You know, like, <laughs> oh, you know, you for, you kind of, cause you've dreamed about and ha wanting something so long. Right. And you've, you know, you just, you, 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 you think of like what you're going to do to it. You think of how it should have came from the factory, you know, like right. your personal touches and, um, man, it's, uh, it's still sometimes surreal. Like I'll look at that. You know how they, they have those memes. Like it, you, you don't love your car unless you look back at it and you know, right, you're walking away. Yeah. Right. I mean, you walk up to it and the door opens for you and you know, it's just like a free valet service and pretty soon self-driving is going to be in effect and it's going to be my personal Uber. I mean, luckily I don't drink, but I literally just have to hop in, hit the foot on the brake, the door will close and off you I'll go. take me to work or wherever. <laughs> so yeah, it's, <laughs> It's surreal. It's surreal having a car that has that much technology mm -hmm. on the road today, you know? Um, yeah. So it's, it is a dream come true. It is. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. And of course, knowing you, it's not staying stock. No. So the first week I got it, <laughs> I was already had plans. So, you know, luckily the person I sold the leaf to, um, owns a paint body shop. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's actually Jeff at paint pros. So, that particular leaf is actually for sales. So everybody wants to see that same car. It's, it's still at, there. It's at Paint Pros. <laughs> but, um, you know, sold it to him for a good price. And part of the deal of that sale was, um, you know, credit for paint. And I knew even back back then, sight unseen, didn't know what color I was going to get. Mm -hmm. I knew that if I was getting a Model X, if it wasn't black, I was going to have the trim. All painted, the black trim. All the yeah. black trim. You know, most SUVs have them. And, uh, cause it makes it appear that the car is four inches taller. It just, I don't know. It's just something that most average mm -hmm. car has. And so, um, so here I am, I get the model X and first place I have f credit to get it painted. Why not? So first place I went to was his shop. And, um, you know, so he told me, yeah, it's, you know, it can be pretty difficult, but you know, we'll have to see and all that. And sure enough, that was one of the first modifications and, and it came out great. Oh, it came out amazing. Like. You know. I'll have to get the video for you. Yeah. So when we do the video here, maybe I'll roll some B-roll of 
mm -hmm. of it coming out of Paint Pro's shop that day. Yeah, it was, uh, man, a turnaround time was like one day. That was awesome. Um, that is. You know, so, but that wasn't the first obstacle. So the, actually the first thing that did, you know, obviously that had to be scheduled and all that, but mm -hmm. I also wanted the window, uh, the front windshield tinted. So that has a story in itself. Well, that windshield's huge. Yeah. So the Model X, ha if no one knows, it uh, has the largest production front windshield um, of, any vehicle. of any vehicle. It's literally like you're sitting in a cockpit of an observatory helicopter. It just... Well, it goes over your head, right? Yeah, absolutely. It goes past beyond my head. <laughs> so, yeah, it's just glass. It's all glass. And uh, and so imagine a window tint film that can cover that much glass is, you know, in my head kind of, you know, you're just not used to that because mm -hmm. most car windows are, you know, or standard side windshield. So, you know, I went to particular a particular shop here in town. I won't mention that name, but <laughs> don't need to promote people that I don't that recommend. Didn't, that, that didn't yeah, work out. They they quoted me for one front windshield, one window, literally one thousand dollars. And I looked at him like I was crazy. I was like, you know what? I get it. it's an exotic. I get not exotic car, but it's a a six figure car. You know, oh, it's faster I, than some exotics. Yeah, uh, yeah, and I just. You know, I was going to expect getting gouged when you have like the this kind of Tesla car. tax. Yeah, the Tesla tax. I was like $1,000. And in my head, okay, in 40, 30 plus years of customizing cars, I know it is just a roll of film with a really talented guy, a squeegee, and a Windex bottle. Like, <laughs> I know what it's going to take until, and it is not going to be $1,000 worth. Right. So I left there and I reached out to another friend of mine who mm -hmm. has done all my cars. And why I didn't reach out to him first because I, I lost his number. So um, I got his number again, <laughs> thanks to more friends. And um, yeah, he did it for a reasonable price and it looks amazing too. So that's great. Yeah. So little things, little touches like that, the trim, yeah. the windshield. Yeah. And I know you're still, yeah. you're still working on it. So the, the build is definitely not done. <laughs> And, yeah. uh, and, and who knows, maybe we could, maybe we could convince wheelhouse to have a little unveiling party when it's done. Yeah. Oh, oh, well, uh, well, that one, I, I gotta have, a, <laughs> gotta, it's gotta be complete to me, you know, like the, when you feel it's yeah. ready. Yeah, when you feel absolutely. It's ready. Yeah. Cause current situation right now is actually, it's at uh Mateo motorsports over in, uh, uh, Arlington. And he actually did some custom one-off pieces on, on the leaf, which actually brought it a lot of attention from overseas around the world. Cause there's leaf owners that to them, customizing that car is just tint and maybe changing the wheels. But well, there's not the much tire. available for Yeah. It. They're just not. And I'm very fortunate to live in a city that has a lot of sources and talented people to make one off, um, to make one offs and builds like this. And yep. so, um, you know, Mateo over there is actually currently, um, you know, doing some, doing things. some fun stuff on it. That's, you know, tasteful, mm -hmm. uh, functional because where the leaf topped out at 95 miles an hour on the backside of the Dames point, this thing's <laughs> 155. So it's gotta definitely be functional and, right. um, you know, so this one's, it's going to be nice and clean, just like mm -hmm. everything I've ever built. And, right. Um, you know, nothing crazy again, I'm still no carbon fiber. So, right. Um, so that'll be nice. Hopefully it'll be done maybe tomorrow or this weekend and then sweet. Um, after that, then it's BC Forge time. So <laughs> Awesome, awesome. So I was going to get towards the end here. I got one last question for you in regards cool. to kind of the scene and EVs and everything else. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing more EVs out on the show circuit? Oh, my gosh, yes. Last year alone, I, if I, I, I swear I get more, more forwards of Model 3s. So Model 3s are the thing, I guess, to customize because, one, they are the most affordable and least expensive of the entire line of Tesla's. Right. Um, they have, you know, they're, they are practical. And again, they range from 38,000 to 60 plus thousand dollars. So they're a little more mod friendly kind right. of thing, you know, in a sense. Um, and <laughs> Elon Musk actually last week, um, downloaded only for the model three is what's called track mode. I'm, pl I'm pretty sure it's track mode. Right. Um, cause model X's don't get it, but it gives you the ability to peel out because you can't burn up tires on any of the electric cars because they're just the technologies that that's great. smart it, it i'll never hear my car burn out but he made it to where you could do it on the <laughs> model threes which <laughs> blows me away so um so yeah so yes to answer your question there are more model threes that's hitting the scene um or electric cars right. hybrid cars there are some priuses out there that's pretty done up um as a matter of fact this time last year if i remember right the um formula drift uh 
uh, series, mm -hmm. there's a Camaro that is fully electric that, you know, they're one of their first races. It was over in California and it uh, unfortunately got banned because, um, after going through tech, the fire department couldn't have this particular vehicle compete mm -hmm. in the series because they're drifting in the city. Right. And just one year prior, they had a Ferrari catch on fire. And oh, so geez. if this test or if this uh, Camaro that's fully electric hits a post office box, I don't know, in the middle of the city, the fire department was not prepared to be able to distinguish this mm -hmm. or save someone's life. So the very first race in the series for this team, they couldn't even compete because the scene's not ready for it, I guess. You know, it's just <laughs> the fire departments weren't ready. They're like, what? Right, what do you right. mean? There's no gas in this thing. So, um, you know, there's that. There's, uh, you know, they're starting to evolve. Mm -hmm. um, I believe he said something about NASCAR starting to go in the hybrid series, you know, in a couple of years. Yeah, yeah. I read something, um, I believe, in the, the earliest estimate, I believe they're talking about 2022, yeah. where NASCAR was talking about maybe going hybrid. That'd be, that'd be interesting. That's crazy because when you think of NASCAR, it's like they're so, you know, all their, their uh, it's, it's, so when you think of hybrid as a consumer, it's supposed to be for economical purposes. Right. Like, right. where would you even fit that in the equation in a racing, like a NASCAR racing series? But hey, more kudos to them that they're starting to evolve, you know. Yeah, it'll be interesting. And it'll be interesting too to see how the hybrid systems are worked in. Yeah. So I don't know any particulars really of it. It's kind of just some headline reading. Yeah. Um, but I don't know if it'll be V8s with a, you know, hybrid assist yeah. or what type of setup it's going to be. Yeah. But it, it'll be, it'll be interesting. Yeah. Well, just recently, two days ago, uh, I was reading, um, uh, unplugged performance. So there are, the, there are dominant, um, aftermarket source resource shop for Tesla's. They okay. have a track car that was in the Tsukuba circuit in Japan and they did a side by side race full interior model three. Mm hmm with street tires, they ran that next to a McLaren P1 mm. and beat it by so many seconds. Like they have recently, look it up. It's on, uh, it was literally like two days ago, like a Model 3, like that someone can buy. Right. Just literally outran a, a P1. professional driver in a McLaren P1 mm -hmm. on a Sakuba circuit. And that's, that's one crazy. of the most technical circuits, I would think. Yeah. You know? Well, and so. even recently too, Tesla took a modified model mm -hmm. s to the ring mm -hmm. and set oh, supposedly yeah. a lap time there as well yeah yeah i mean you know when these teslas have a coefficient of drag that's comparable to exotic cars mm -hmm. yeah i mean how do you how do you I mean, it only makes sense you know bring it out to the track <laughs> and you know they're so torque you know heavy it's just it's surreal it, it's if you've never been in ridden in one even without ludicrous plus mode even with a standard, it, it just, it's a mind blowing. It's a weird feeling. It's, um, cause there's no visceral feeling. There's no like noise. There's, there's no commotion there's no gears. Yeah. yeah you, when, when you took us out and we did a couple runs, yeah, that was, it's it just is, wind. It is a <laughs> weird feeling. Yeah. It is really, it's a roller coaster feeling it, it where is. you have that sudden burst of acceleration, but there's no commotion. Yeah. And you get that roller coaster feeling as well as, in like in your stomach too like you get nauseous because it's a different kind of feel like, well you're not prepared for it yeah yeah exactly and so um so yeah so that's like the future ev it's definitely coming into play more and more and there's guys playing with suspensions and it's common and everything yeah absolutely and hopefully i'm going to be one of the first ones out there with a model x that's actually like done tasteful or whatnot so i look forward to seeing it yeah Cool. Thanks. So I got one last thing I like to play with every guest that comes on. Okay. Uh, we do a daily race and crush. I've the last couple I've kind of themed out. So I got a theme for you as well. Okay. So I'm calling it the fast and furious Paul Walker edition. Mm. So I'm going to give you three cars. Okay. And you're going to tell me which one you want a daily, which one you want to race and which one's going to get crushed. Oh, crushed. Oh, good. So <laughs> one's not going to make the cut. One All does right. not make the cut. I am ready. All right. Okay. So Toyota Supra. Mm, wait, which generation? The first, from the first movie. Oh, Mark IV. Mark IV. Okay, all right. Yep. Okay. Mark IV, Turbo Supra. Yeah, okay. so these are the movie cars. So when, oh. I, so when I go in, that's why I call it the Fast and the Furious edition. Okay. So Paul Walker's Supra. Okay. Paul Walker's Evo. And mm. Paul Walker's R34. Oh, man. Yeah, that's pretty tough. <laughs> wait, so when you're asking these questions in the movie status or as if I had those three type cars? No, we'll just, we'll just say those three cars specifically. Okay. 
to actually have yep. and build. Yep. So if you had all three of those sitting in a garage and you had to choose, one you got to daily, one you got to race, and the other one had to go away. Oh, man. I mean, all three are very <laughs> – oh, you could – Oh, you man. Um, so R34 is always like, what? see, I'm going to get killed by every one of my Nissan Infiniti friends. Cause <laughs> I mean, as cool as that, I love the Blackbird, the R34, that whole body style thing. I just, I, I, I couldn't see it as a daily. So let's do process elimination. Okay. I couldn't see that car as a daily. Perfect. Um, if I had to modify one of those three, I don't think I would choose the R34. I just, even though it's all wheel drive okay. and you know, the whole right hand drive thing. And, you know, again, I have a ton of friends out there with right hand drive cars that they let me drive. So it's not like I've never experienced it. Um, you know, I just, I hate using the word crush, but that'd well, probably be the one that <laughs> skyline would, gets crushed. Yeah. The, the skyline. Man, so GTR. we got straight to the dirt. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, a Supra is a, t such a timeless car. That car built in 1994 to today is still as aerodynamic as, some of these cars that's up in the post. I mean, it's just a very timeless silhouette mm -hmm. car. And aged very well. It's aged well. There's the body lines are smooth. It's sleek. It makes sense. Like somehow it still has back seats, but no one's ever used them. I mean, it just, it's still able to do power. I have a friend literally over in Texas right now. It, his car, you know, does, you know, probably a thousand horsepower and um, solid with like. That's well, an easy build. Yeah. Well, easy. Yeah, they're documented builds. Yeah. Easy documented as in easy. You well, know, I mean, relative, relatively, safety. relatively. Yeah. I mean, when you're talking about $32,000 transmissions on GTR having 1,350 horsepower versus a Supra that has a thousand horsepower and, you know, has a trainee that you can get for, you know, a couple grand. I mean, $32,000 of grenades in one track race. And then you got one that lasts a good bit. You know, it's kind of hard. So track wise, and even though, man, so now you got the Evo, <laughs> um, <laughs> man. So see, that's a trick question because I was a Mitsubishi guy for 16 years. I know. That's why I figured I'd throw that one oh, in there. Oh man. Well, <laughs> cause I have been to the shootout and I have seen the Evo. As a matter of fact, I even had a Galan VR4 and I never got to finish, but, um, knowing the potential of that car, I would daily the Evo only because it's uh, four door. Okay. Um, All right. It's something I could bring friends and posse with and companies out there like STM up in Rochester, New York. They've tried and proven built nine second Evos with full interiors. And yep. knowing that aspect and knowing that you can do that, I could see myself dailying an Evo over a Supra. And then that kind of leaves the Supra as race the, the Supra as the, as the race one. The ironic part is I'm so not a 1320 guy anymore. I'm so big into more of the road course auto crossing, you know, right. you make lefts and rights. So it's weird that that would be the one, but I think out of <laughs> default, that's the one that, that wins out of the three. So it's right. a twisted answer to a twisted question. <laughs> <laughs> to, to a guy like me that thinks outside the box. So. Yeah, I was, I was hoping yeah. a few of those would throw you for a curve. Oh, man, all three threw me a curve because, yeah, for sure. <laughs> it's <was> awesome. awesome. <laughs> well, Ernie, I thank you very much for taking the time to come out and be with us this evening. Thanks. Hopefully yep. it was entertaining for people and I didn't put people to sleep. No, no we had, I, I had a great time. I always love chatting. So we'll be putting all of Ernie's information out on the descriptions of both video, podcast, everywhere you can find it. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, everywhere else. And also, we'll, Ernie will hook up all your social in the description as well. Cool. Awesome. Well, thanks again, everybody, for listening to the License and Registration Show. And we'll talk to you again soon. Are you ready to see somebody's need for speed? Why can't put our wings in the wind faster than you could ever be? Stop. We are on a crash course of freedom is running on as long as